Hello everyone, uh, really nice to see you guys today. So today I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about robot skill acquisition and I'll talk a little bit about policy representation, but the majority of the time I will spend on talking about data generation or how to get the data that we can train uh, robot policies. So many of you probably know me, so I work on uh, robot perception and also manipulation. And I think uh, in our work, what we're really trying to do is try to push the boundaries for robot capabilities. Right? So for example, making, making, basically making robots to do things that was not possible before. So for example, cutting avocados, tossing objects, or blowing leaves. So throughout all these projects in the past, one thing that uh, our group start to get quite familiar and also kind of good at is to design those very task-specific action primitives. Right? So for example, um, and for many of the projects that I just show you here, um, it typically works with a, a, a general workflows like this. Right? So first, you kind of start by thinking about the task that you want to work on. So for example, if you want you to make your robot able to toss objects or unfolding cloths, um, the first steps that we're going to do is to sit down and then think about what are the action primitives, what are the type of actions we need the robot to, um, to learn, and then design and, and carefully design those action primitives, like those tossing action, fling action, and swing actions. So these steps of uh, action primitive design is actually very critical in many of the projects, because fundamentally what it al allows us to do is to map those very complex action sequences, for example, those tossing action, into just a few learnable parameters that can critically determine the action outcomes for different robots. Right? So for example, for, to make the robot able to toss very precisely, we basically code up the whole tossing trajectory. The whole trajectory is fixed, and the only parameter the system needs to learn is the releasing velocity for, the, for tossing. Right? It's only one parameter that is learned. And then that parameter is actually enough to actually give the robot the control of like how to like where the uh, the object will be la landing, and then similarly for the class unfolding task, we use the fling uh, action primitives to basically as a starting point, and then the only thing that the system needs to learn is the grasping locations on the class. Right, so with that, like we basically uh, front load all the complexities instead of learning how to fling. It instead just uh, the robot only needs to learn how to grasp the class so that it can execute a fling action. And then once we have those uh, well-designed action primitives, the later step becomes quite easy. We just need to collect a lot of robot data overnight, for example, tossing data that the robot tossed overnight. And there's this kind of trend error process. And then um, the robot can learn those, like, a few parameters that we defined uh, through this, uh, with all this data set. And then finally, you will have a working demo. So, this pipeline actually has been working pretty well for us for a few years, and I think it particularly works well under this kind of do, uh, low data regime. It means that when you don't have a lot of robot data to train the different action primitives. So what this framework really allows us to do is to make robots to kind of try to focus on learning the most critical parameters in action with less amount of data, instead of learning everything from scratch. However, there's also a few downsides about this framework, right? So first of all, designing those action primitives actually requires a lot of engineering effort and also insight. Um, so it actually spent, we need to spend a lot of time to think about what is the right parameterization for different action primitives. And uh, I think more importantly is that um, those action primitives sometimes it's just not general enough to represent all possible robot actions, especially the, uh, those robot actions that require high rate and reactive behaviors. So, which means that oftentimes you need to redesign new action primitives for new tasks. So, slowly as we start to realize that this step of action primitive design start to become the bottleneck for the whole framework. So, recently, I think we, our whole group started to kind of changing the workflow a little bit, right? Especially after this work on uh, diffusion policy. So, what we learned uh, is that instead of trying to always carefully design the action primitive. We start to see a lot of strong evidence that it's possible for the robots to kind of directly learn those complex manipulation skills directly from um, human demonstration data. Right. So, for example, uh, here is diffusion policy trained for a variety of tasks, all using the same network architecture. We don't need to change network architecture design, and we just need to swap out different data. And you can do a lot of different tasks, and if you pay uh, attention to this corner task that's trying to do the mark flipping task, you can see that the robot is actually 
kind of able to organically switching between different action primitives like pick and place and uh, pushing, and also able to robustly recover from like uh, failures like pick up failures. So all those things are something that's really hard to code up with just uh, action primitives. But the robot is able to learn that all from data or all from the human demonstration data now. So at this point, probably one question in your head is that the idea of learning from human de demonstration, isn't that pretty straightforward? Like, isn't that pretty trivial? Why well, we haven't done it before? All right, so the quick answer is that for a while, learning from demonstration or behavior cloning actually is pretty hard to make it w work well uh, in, in, in reality. And in fact, if you ever take a class in robot learning, the first few lectures will basically talk about behavior cloning and, why, and all, all its limitations. Right, so for example, people often uh, worry about or encounter issues like how to really train a policy that's able to model complex action distributions or how to collect the right uh, demonstration data for the robot to learn effectively. And then finally, uh, people also oftentimes criticize or has concerns about whether behavior cloning or learning from demonstration is able to really allow the robot to generalize. Right? I think all those are very valid concerns. And in today's talk, we're going to kind of get to a little bit of all these three problems and see how we can potentially uh, bypass or kind of partially address some of those challenges. So first uh, challenge is about how to model this very complex action distribution. Right? So uh, there's actually many different aspects about how, like, the, why the action distribution is complex. But one very concrete example is that if you want to learn from human demonstration, you really need to be able to kind of model this kind of action multimodality. So what action multimodality means is that given the same state or same visual observation from the, uh, from the robot, there may be multiple valid actions that can, po uh, can possibly complete the task. Right? So for example, if your task is trying to p uh, push this T to the target location, like uh, this green uh, location, there, uh, and then the, the blue dot is your end factor, there, you can actually go, either go from the left or go from the right to complete this task. Right? And this kind of mo action multimodality actually appears quite often in human demonstration uh, data because there are just intrinsically many different ways to complete the same task. So the problem here is that if you uh, try to make the policy learn from this kind of uh, complex distribution, um, if you just try to minimize its output action, like the distance be uh, between the output action with respect to e e uh, both of the distributions, you easily get an action that is not valid. So for example, going into the middle. Right? So if, you, if your policy are not able to kind of handle this kind of action multimodality issue, your policy can easily get stuck. That is a typical failure mode for learning from uh, demonstration. So how diffusion policy is able to address that? So first, maybe let me talk about what is diffusion policy. So I guess many of you guys probably are very familiar with the idea of diffusion model. Oftentimes, you probably see that uh, used for image generation, like uh, DALI. So the idea is that you can learn a general distribution of images from a large collection of image data sets. And similarly here, we are using very similar idea. We're trying to train a diffusion model. But instead of generating images, we are trying to generate robot actions. Right, so here, uh, a concrete um, example is that in the uh, robot action, we, uh, in this particular example, we represent it as a 2D and factor trajectories. Right? Those dots are the actions that we're trying to generate. And then like uh, image generation, you go from complete noise to a, a high resolution uh, image. We are trying to generate, uh, try to denoise the random action into a clean action that the robot can execute. So what makes diffusion policy different is this iterative denoising process, which turned out to be an excellent way to help the system to model this kind of multi-model distribution in, uh, the, uh, in the robot action, um, action space. Right? So which is something just uh, a lot of prior work kind of, tried to, uh, kind of struggled with. So in addition to able to model this kind of multi-model distribution, it's mod, uh, the, the resulting prediction is also very precise, meaning that it's not a, just approximation of the action, uh, action distribution. Um, which we will probably see that in the kind of quantized the classification uh, action representation. So here is a slide I'm trying to uh, use to kind of give you a little bit of intuition about why diffusion policy is able to capture multimodalities, right? So one way to think about this diffusion process is basically thinking about this as a 
gradient descent process on the action space, where uh, the predicted gradient view can easily have any numbers of local minimas. And if you use gradient descent, it's very likely you can kind of stuck in certain local minimas. And in this case, actually stuck in local minima is a good thing because each of the local minima can help you to capture a mode. And also, when the output is sketched to a particular local minima, it's also very precise. It's not approximation around that mode. So that is like the intuition why diffusion policy is able to capture multimodalities. And then, actually, in addition to just the ability to model actual multimodality, diffusion policy also provides a, a number of other advantages. Right? So for example, uh, it turned out to be scaled really well with respect to action uh, dimensions. So it means that you can actually now make your robot to predict a trajectory of action instead of the single step action in the future. And then also uh, diffusion policy is relative, is much stable to train compared to other generative models. So all these benefits or advantages um, is what make diffusion policy a really practical framework for learning any robot behaviors as long as you have the data. So in our paper, we actually continue to test uh, uh, diffusion policy on more and more tasks. Uh, so what surpri really surprised us is that we can always observe a, like a, a consistent performance boost. Sometimes it's a large boost, sometimes it's smaller uh, improvement, but it's always consistently able to improve the performance regardless of the tasks that we test on. Uh, so that is actually pretty surprising. And also at some point, I think my student Cheng starts to just get a feeling that if we can collect the data, we can make the robot to do any task we want. Question? Like, what was the blue and what was the gray? Oh, um, yeah, so the blue is the perform uh, performance of our method, and the gray is the best baseline on that benchmark. Yeah, so it's always slightly better like, or, or better. Yeah. Yeah, so at some point, we test, actually test on multiple different benchmarks. It's not just one benchmark. And different benchmarks often are designed for different tasks or highlight different properties of the algorithm. Um, and then at some point, Chen start to feel like, yeah, maybe we're at the stage that uh, if we can collect the right robot data, we can make the robot to do whatever task we want. So I know that this statement sounds a little bit crazy, um, but I think in some sense it's kind of true because this is actually what our collaborators in TRI is able to achieve by basically scaling up this simple uh, um, framework of diffusion policy. And many of the tasks here is actually something that I thought was impossible before, like flipping pancakes or rolling doughs. So the question now is actually, should we just keep doing it so, and then until the robot will be solved? Well, I really hope so, but the answer is clearly no, right? I just started my talk. You still have a lot to go. Um, so I think the, the, uh, the issue is that we cannot really ignore this really big if in this statement. That is, if we can collect the data, right? And in fact, it is not any kind of data, oh, big if. <laughs> There's actually a lot of effort and intelligence needed to capture or get the right type of data. Right, so for example, here is a secret recipe for you to get the right data. The first step for you to get uh, this uh, high quality robot data to train behavioral cloning is to really train yourself so that you can think and behave like a robot. Right, so for example, for the mark flipping case, I didn't show you the demonstration phase. You, we actually use this kind of space mouse uh, to collect the, the, the robot demonstration, and it's actually really non-intuitive non interface. And then it kind of, at some point, you need to like mentally compute IK in order to know whether you're reaching the limit. So, so far, I think in our team, only Suyuan is able to collect data for this task, and no one else. Right? So you either need to train yourself really hard or hire Suyuan for data collection. Oh, and then second step, oops. Second step is to make sure that you collect a lot of data to cover your task space. So that in the test time, your generalization just become interpolation in your training data. And then the third step is actually also very important, but a little bit subtle, is that you need to anticipate the robot failures, right? Knowing when the robot will fail and also explicitly collect some uh, uh, failure recovery behaviors so that the end policy will be more robust. And finally, also most importantly, you need to protect your environment so that your colleague don't touch your camera before demo. Right? So actually, it's interesting that a learning from demonstration or behavioral cloning can easily give you a demo, like working demo in, on the real robot. But it also has a very short shelf life, meaning that if you shift the camera a little bit, you need to recollect data again. So 
all this are making like uh, this framework not very scalable. And then, yeah, another way I would was, I was like to think that all these issues is actually just really reflect the fact that we are not yet having the right data for robot learning, right? In particular, I'd like to highlight there are three aspects of data that we really need to, uh, we really need. That is data that is scalable, reusable, and the robot complete. So why are all these different three aspects are important? So I think in today's, um, context of machine learning or big data, I oftentimes found that the scale is the only thing that people emphasize. However, I think in robotics, it, the story is quite different. Well, it's at least slightly different, that where having the data that is reusable and the robot complete is oftentimes even more important than just the scale. And I think maybe, at least I think, that the lack of careful thought on this later two requirement is maybe the true reason why we haven't put our robots on the same scaling trend as other ML field. So today I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into like these two requirements and how we can potentially get there. So over the years, we actually have seen a lot of seemingly scalable solutions, but in reality, insufficient. Right, so for example, I'm just gonna use my own work as example. Like earlier, I showed this tossing bot case. This robot actually able to collect its own training data 24-7 by resetting its own state. So in some sense, it is a system that's extremely scalable. It can collect a tons of data without human supervision. However, um, it has a lot of, uh, so the hidden cost here is that you need to carefully engineer the environment for a particular task. And then as a result, the data you collected with this framework is not reusable for different setup, different cost, or different tasks, or different robot setup. Right, so that is what makes this, uh, 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 this kind of particular framework, although scalable, but it's not reusable. And similarly, for the internet data, I think uh, you can download a lot of images and videos from the internet. It's in some sense very scalable, and also you can reuse it for different projects. However, um, I think unfortunately, most of the internet data are missing very critical information for robot learning. Right? So for example, you, don't, you cannot get those embodied actions or observations. So as a result, we call it it's incomplete for learning robot policies. So as a result, it's not saying that they are irrelevant for robot learning, they are still very important, but oftentimes you, you do need to design much more sophisticated algorithms to make use of the, those data in an indirect way. So how we can move forward, right? So if you think about it kind of on a very high level, I think re there's really just two paths uh, around it, right? So one is that you can simul uh, kind of scale up your data collection in simulation environments or scaling up your robot data in real world. And today, my goal is not trying to kind of argue which path is better, but instead, I try to give both paths a fair chance by carefully thinking about what are the pros and cons, and also more importantly, what are the bottlenecks and the hidden costs along each of the paths? Like, what's the true bottleneck along each path? And are we possibly, like, is there possible ways to bypass them? So first, uh, let's look at a simulation. I think simulators are something like really reusable. I think it can easily share it across different uh, labs and uh, projects. And it's also something that we typically use for benchmarking in robotics today. So what is the bottleneck for a simulation environment or scaling up in simulation? I think, for, I think maybe slightly different from the popular opinions, I'm actually less concerned about accuracy in simulation right? because I feel that's something that clearly can be improved with more compute and more accurate models. But instead, what really worries me the most is the setup cost in simulation for a new tasks, which is often overlooked by people when thinking about uh, simulation for data generation. Right? So for example, even given an existing environment, a simulation environment, there is still non-trivial amount of effort that's needed to put in in order to get the robot complete data that's ready for training your policy. That includes the embodied action, observation, and most importantly, non-zero success rate for the task you care about. So oftentimes, in order to get those kind of data, you either need to kind of tally up your robot in simulation or craft your reward function uh, and or policy for exploration. So none of them are easy. So as a result, Oftentimes we can see that uh, simulation is easy to scale up for one task, but it's really hard to scale up for many tasks. So one of our recent projects really tried to address uh, this problem a little bit by automating a, a large portion of those engineering efforts with large entry models. So this is a project called uh, Scaling Up and Distill Down, and uh, this is led by my student Hui and my collaborator uh, Pete Florence from Google. So 
For this project, we basically has two parts to it. So in the first part, we're trying to scale up the data collection process by using large language models and the simulation state. So what we do is that given uh, any new task that you want the robot to do, like sending the packages for return, we'll first use large language model to recursively break down the task into smaller subtasks. That's very similar to a lot of other works that's using LLMs for planning. But the difference here is that we also allow the large language model to call those low-level uh, sampling-based utility functions to really like uh, try different low-level strategies um, to complete the task. Right. So, for example, the large language model can call like different motion uh, motion um, planner and a, a grass sampler and a place sampler. So basically. What we can achieve is by using those sampling-based um, utility functions, we introduce some randomness for exploration in those low-level manipulation strategies. But at the same time, we also use large range models' uh, common sense knowledge to help us break down the task and also narrow down the search space so that the exploration is more efficient. And then we also use the large-range model to help us to generate a reward function or checking function for each of the subtasks to verify whether each of the subtasks is successful or not by using simulation state. Right? So this uh, reward function is actually directly using the simulation state to check whether each of those subtasks is successful or not. And, the, and if the subtask is not successful, the, the system will basically keep trying on the low level uh, uh, on the subtask before it popping out to a higher level. And this uh, step actually is quite critical because it helps, it allows the system to self-correct its mistakes and also rec uh, record those re retry behaviors. So remember in the earlier uh, strategy, one of the steps is actually to anticipate the robot failure and also record the failure recovery behaviors. So now we basically can get those kind of data for free. And then at this step, uh, what we will have is, uh, like in the, by the end of this process, what we'll get is a multitask language labeled robot dataset that contains a lot of robot experience to complete a large number of different tasks. And then the second phase is actually quite straightforward. We're basically trying to distill down all those uh, robot experience into a visual motor policy that can be directly applied in, for example, real world by inferring actions from raw sensory inputs. Right? So by doing this distillation step, we no longer need to rely on simulation state for executing action. The policy is just taking raw image input and inferred action. And also very importantly is that by doing this distillation step, uh, the system actually has a chance to continuously improve its performance with more and more experience without really the need of fine tuning the large, large chunk model itself, which is oftentimes a lot more ex uh, expensive. So in the, in the end of the paper, we actually uh, test out on a variety of different tasks, all requires uh, six of uh, closed loop actions. And the many of the tasks actually requires non-trivial common sense reasoning, which is enabled by the large range model. And then in the quantitative evaluation, I want to just highlight one particular result that is uh, kind of trying to demonstrate the effect of the retry data. So in the last two performance bar, they're basically showing on the same policy, the same diffusion policy, um, trained on the uh, simulation data. However, one is trained with, with and without the retried data, meaning that whether you have the um, the data that's uh, uh, using the a large model to verify that it's not successful and correct its behavior. Right, so you can see that there's a really big performance improvement without changing the policy at all, but just changing the data. Right, so I think the important takeaway here is that it's actually critical to have some suboptimal data in your training data, especially if you're trying to learn from demonstration, so that the robot can learn how to recover from its own failure as well. Okay, so as you can imagine, this uh, framework of scaling up and distill down is quite general. Like you can use the large range model to generate training data uh, for almost any task that you want as long as you have the simulation environment. However, uh, if you want to take this idea one step further and make it really useful for like real world robot deployment, it's still a lot of things missing, right? So for example, uh, we didn't talk about how to generate that environment uh, at the first place, like how to get those CAD models and loading all the objects. So that part now is still manual. And then second is that how we need to have a like, way much better way to do sim to real transfer. The render image still doesn't look like realistic. However, personally, I feel like this two problem with all the advancements with generative AI and everything, we can actually see a past that they can be potentially improved and addressed in the future. 
However, that does require to wait a little bit, like wait for the simulator to get better or better sim to, uh, to real uh, techniques. So what if you're not patient enough? What you can do with the real world data today, right? So again, let's look at uh, the different paths and think about what is the true bottleneck for scaling up uh, the real world data for robots? Again, I think uh, maybe slightly different from the popular opinions. I think the need for, actually the need of using human as a demonstrator may not be the true bottleneck. But I think guess that the lack of an intuitive and standardized interface might be the, the real bottleneck. So why is that? So or why, I think, uh, why I think so? So if you look at the internet data that we have today, actually all this data is collected by human, collected by people. However, we don't find this really hard because we have a very intuitive or existing interface to allow people to, do, to collect those data or to generate those data. You can use keyboard to type text, you can use cameras to capture images, right? So those are the hardware interface that really enables this data set. And similarly, if you still don't believe me, if you think about the self-driving car scenario, um, I think the reason why a self-driving car can get, actually get a head start on like learning-based method is because we already have an existing interface that allows anyone who can drive help to collect data. And the data is actually immediately robot-complete because it contains the right sensory input and also the, uh, the right robot action. Well, uh, driving is not only collecting the data from the car. You need to collect the data from the eyes of the human as it interacts with others. There is so much cognition going in the brain about the driving that we cannot collect mm -hmm. directly. Otherwise, we would have solved it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, there is it's still not complete. But I will say that another way to think about it is that you can collect a lot more data than what a human can observe as well, right? So you actually can go beyond the human uh, sensing capabilities. You can have much wider field of view. You can have, add more cameras. But the key here is that uh, we don't need to train an expert or like we don't need to train a few experts to collect those data. It's pretty easy to scale up. We, we need to the so. That's true as well. Yeah, maybe it's useful, yeah. Okay, so the question here uh, is, can we create a similar interface for robot manipulation that's able to allow anyone that is not trained roboticist to collect data for any task they care about in any environment they want to, uh, the robot to, de uh, to be deployed? So this question actually is uh, something that motivates a number of our projects in our group. And one of the earlier ones that's actually before I started in Columbia is the project called Grasping in the Wild. So the idea here is that we can use uh, a grabbing tool that people are already using in their daily life to collect the trash or grabbing objects as an interface for data collection. And so basically what you do is add an RGBD camera to record the, the sensory observations and you can track the camera motion to recover the robot actions. And then as a result, you can, with this device, you can get into any environment to collect robot complete data for manipulation. Uh, and the one way to think about uh, this uh, kind of uh, grasping in the wild interface is that it really provides us a very nice middle ground between uh, this kind of in the lab uh, tally operation data and also the in the wild robot hu uh, human uh, videos, right? Because it can simultaneously minimize the embodiment gap and also remain intuitive and flexible. However, uh, while the idea is quite exciting, I think at that time limited by my own engineering skills, we still didn't really fully achieve the, uh, the full potential for such device or such idea. And so the reality is that although theoretically, the user can use a such interface to collect a very diverse set of actions to perform different tasks, but we found out is that not all the data is transferable to a robot policy. And then why that's the case? Let's look at like the actual low-level details of what the, what the issue is. Right, so the first uh, problem is the selection, the choice of camera. So although having a wrist mount camera is actually very critical to make the system portable so that you don't need to have external camera. However, having a camera on the, like, so close to the, your manipulator means that you have very restricted uh, view, uh, uh, visual coverage and you also oftentimes don't have uh, sufficient visual context for, to, uh, for the robot to infer action. Um, and also when the, uh, when you, when the robot actually moving very fast, it, you, you observe very fast camera motions and as a result making tracking the action or tracking the camera very difficult. And then if you care about manipulation, it's very important to have high quality or high precision tracking, otherwise you won't, you'll miss the object. 
And then last one is also pretty subtle but very important. It's the latency discrepancies between the data collection and the robot deployment. Right? When you collect the data, there's almost no latencies between the visual observation and action. However, when you train a policy on your robot, you actually will observe very, uh, like many different sensor uh, uh, latencies or inference latencies or execution latencies depends on your hardware. And those different uh, latencies will actually easily result in out of distribution observations or and then lead to out of sync actions. So all those are subtle but very important issues that prevent us to like really unlock the full potential of this uh, framework. So as a result, if you look at a lot of uh, work in this area, as in, uh, also including like people from NIU, they also try similar ideas. Um, the, the resulting system, although they are very easy to achieve very impressive visual diversity, means that you can take those devices into many different environments. However, the uh, resulting system is uh, often has very low in action diversity, means that they also only do simple actions like grasping or pick and place, which is a little bit unsatisfying because what we really care about in robotics is the action diversity, right? And that is exactly something that we cannot get from internet data, but now we cannot get it either. So how to address those issues? I think the most fundamental question that I kind of asked myself or like um, again and again is that is the wrist mount camera ever gonna be enough to enable large variety of manipulation tasks, right? Do we really need to rely on our external camera or wrist mount camera is actually okay? So I think my current answer is that yes, if we try to make a few important modifications. And all this modification and idea, I really need to give credit to Chen and Zhen Jia, who are the students in my, in my, in my group that make all this uh, uh, system work. So, the first improvements or upgrades is on the camera. So f we actually switch from the typical camera field of view to into a fish eye lens that give us a much wider uh, ultra wide field of view that allows the robot to see much bigger visual context in order to infer the action. This is actually very, very critical. And the second is that uh, with bigger field of view, it also has more visual feature for tracking. So it means that even during manipulation or when you are very close to the object, you still have enough uh, features to track. And when you combine it with the IMU sensor that is already in the GoPro camera, you, we can actually achieve pretty precise tracking even on the very fast movement. And then another smart, a smart design that is, uh, uh, Chen and uh, come up with is using those kind of side mirrors to help us to give, uh, uh, to give the robots a, new, uh, a slightly different perspective to help them estimate depths, right? So if you only have one camera, you actually don't know the depth information, but if you add a two small mirror on the side, they actually give you a different perspective, you can kind of run stereos on that. So we call that uh, implicit stereo. And then uh, other design decisions like, uh, for example, we also add the, April tag on each of the fingers so that you can continuously track uh, the gripper width, which is actually quite important because you want to recover those precise gripper actions like timing and force. And then by using a deformable uh, gripper, or like kind of like a soft finger, we are able to get a pretty nice compliance when you're like interacting with the environment. And you can also kind of get like a little bit of implicit force measurement by observing the deformation itself. So this is actually an example of this soft uh, finger grasping uh, an egg. And then beyond the visual features, we also uh, found out that you can actually add different sensor modalities. Uh, for example, a microphone um, onto the fingertip. And so in particular, in this case, we use a contact microphone that can help you to pick up those contact information, like whether you're in contact with the object or what kind of surface you're sliding on. And then this contact microphone can be directly plugged in into the GoPro camera, so you don't need to have any additional um, hardware to record these new sensor modalities. And then most importantly, we also make sure that um, this device is actually compatible with different uh, robot platforms, like UR5 or Franca, uh, and then as, as a result, the same data collected with this uh, uh, handheld gripper can be used for like, training policies for different robot embodiments. So in the end of the day, we only, the, the end of product of all the data collection is just a single MP4 file that contains all the information needed for training an effective policy, for example, uh, those kind of multi-sensor observations or detailed robot actions. And we really hope that this data format can be like a standard and shareable data that for robot manipulation that can be shared across different labs and projects. 
So at this point, you're probably very curious about what we can do with a device like this. Right? So let's look at some demos on some hard manipulation tasks. So the first example is tossing, right? We talked about that tossing is actually something really hard to tally opt with uh, like a, a slow interface like space mouse. And it also re requires very accurate tracking under fast motion. And it also requ requires very precise timing for the gripper released uh, um, uh, action. So that's why, oops. That's why you know, a lot of our uh, projects before we try to design those carefully designed tossing primitives. But here you can just uh, take the gripper and able to uh, collect data yourself and teach robot this new skill. And here's the robot uh, policy rollout with trained on 200 demonstrations. And uh, you can see the robot is actually sorting different objects, round object to round bin, square object to the square bin. And it's able to achieve around like 80%, well, almost 90% success, uh, tossing success rate. And then one uh, thing that we noticed also in this task is that handling latency or m make sure that the latency matching is correct is very critical. So in today's talk, I won't get into details of how we actually able to match or compensate different latency. But the short version of the story is that if you don't handle the latency well, then you are very likely to observe this kind of jerky motion on your robot because observation is out of distribution. And then this kind of jerky motion is actually OK if you only care about quasi-static pick and place task. But for tossing, it's very obviously not a good idea because it can destroy all the momentum that the robot trying to build up. And then as a result, most of the robot cannot land into the, to the beans because the velocity is not uh, uh, sufficient. And then another task we test on is uh, by, mon uh, by manual folding. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a task as we have done before, but with a lot of carefully designed primitives and state machines. Uh, and we, we are able to design a robot that's able to fold class, but it's very, very complicated and really fragile, really easy to break. Um, but now you can just have two handheld gripper, and you can demonstrate a large variety of tasks that's required by manual manipulation. And I don't know whether you catch it, but uh, actually the start and a, a, a stop for the data capturing is voice controlled. Because at this point, both of your hand is occupied. Uh, you don't know how to turn it on and off. So you can voice control it. OK, so this is how the robot is able to like, execute this task after, again, uh, uh, demonstrate 200 demonstrations. And then in this task, actually, it's very important to kind of, it's, it kind of tests the coordination and the synchronization between these two arms. Right? So for example, uh, when, you, when the robot arm is trying to pick up uh, this part of the class, they, they need to synchronize very well. If one of the robot arms is slightly slower, it will fail on doing this task. And then, so to address this problem, we actually introduced this, what we call the inter gripper post uh, input as an additional input to the policy. You can read it on the paper uh, to figure out the details. But the key here I want to deliver is that it's important to consider the synchronization. And then finally, the last task we test on is something that we have never attempted before, which is this dishwashing task. Right, so if you ask me, I don't even know how I should like, start by like, writing out the primitives and design the state machines for this task. Because it is an ultra-long horizon task that each step's success depends on the purest one. And also, the robot needs to kind of deal with, a, kind of perceive and manipulate the very complex objects or fluid objects like the water and the ketchup. And then, uh, you also need to kind of manipulate those constraints, articular objects, which requires mechanical compliance that is provided by our uh, soft uh, finger. And then finally, it need to like, know how to use deform mode to select like the sponge. And then the whole system also needs to be robust uh, to this semantic concept of cleanness, because we want uh, the system to know when to stop once it actually uh, finish this wiping. And also, if you add more ketchup onto the plate, the, the robot should learn like, to continue to uh, wash it. So this is a very complex task. And then here is how it works. It's turn on the faucet, um, pick up the plate, pick up the sponge, wipe the, the ketchup. And if you add more ketchup, it will come back to continue to, to wash it, add more, continue to wash it. And now you try to put back everything, close the faucet. If you messed up, it actually learns how to correct it. Right? So it is actually pretty robust, at least uh, seeing in this uh, video. I think it is actually pretty surprising to us that it actually can work. So just to make sure that uh, uh, it's, we are not uh, cherry picking the results, here is actually all the rollouts that we, we did in the uh, Stanford Robotics Center. And then indeed, it's not always successful. Right? There, I think the, um, at the average success rate is 70% for this task. But we see a sign of life. 
Okay, so another thing I want to highlight a little bit, uh, you probably already see all, all the capabilities, but in addition to the enabling new capabilities, I also want to address these questions of generalization, right? Because we are still training a beha behavioral cloning policy, and most of people will really worry about whether your policy is able to generalize. I think indeed, for most of the uh, tasks that I'm showing you today, which we are, what we are doing is what we call narrow domain evaluation. It means that you are collecting the training data in the same environment as where the robot is going to deploy. Meaning that if you want the robot to wash dishes in your home, you need to collect data yourself. Um, and then we, we do vary the, config, uh, the initial configuration of the robot and the object, and that is uh, the something that we show in the overlay here. But now, uh, I think this kind of narrow domain evaluation is pretty standard in uh, behavioral cloning paper evaluation. Um, but it's not very ideal if you want to actually make the robot a product and able to kind of deploy it anywhere. So the difference now is that with a uh, Wumi gripper, uh, we're probably able to collect a lot of uh, demonstration data on a, a large variety of environments. So the question now is that if we have a lot of diverse uh, training data, can, we, can our robot now able to learn from those diverse data and immediately generalize to auto domain uh, environment and perform this kind of auto domain evaluation. Right, so that is the question that we want to answer. And in this uh, generalization experiment, we actually studied a relatively uh, simple task because we want to really scale up the data collection in many different environments. So this is a, the cup uh, arrange, rearrangement task that we want to rearrange the cup by rotating the cup and then put uh, and perform a pick and place. So this task, although it looks much simpler than the dishwashing task, is still now trivial because it needs to combine different action space and also like uh, like for example the under actuated pushing and also process pick and place. Right, so for this task. We, our students actually go around the campus and collect a lot of the, uh, human demonstration data like for, for in many different environments. And we're gonna train one diffusion policy with all this data that we collected. And then after that, we'll basically pick a sunny day, roll out our robot uh, into an environment that we never collected data in, and then put down some new objects that we have, uh, like new cups that the robot never seen before. And then we'll just let the robot to do the rollout. Wow, so in this, in this particular example, the robot is able to kind of um, just immediately generalize to this unseen object and unseen environment uh, without any further fine tuning in this particular environment. And that is because of the diverse training data that we used. And then also because this whole system only rely on a response camera, no environment camera, and also we predict relative actual trajectory. Um, it's actually, the system is actually robust to based movement. So you can move the robot based around, it's still able to perform the task. So that actually makes it a really nice uh, framework for uh, mobile manipulation systems. And then we try to stress test the system by basically taking our robots out for a walk and anywhere around the campus, and then uh, try to test the, the algorithm performance. Right, so the average success rate is about a 75 success, uh, like success rate. Sometimes it's still that not able to perform the task, but for the majority of time, it's able to do the task pretty well. Like there is, uh, you probably recognize all the spots in, in Compass. Yeah, and this one is particularly like surprising to us that you can put the, uh, the, the robot on a fountain that's not even a table and the robot is able to do the task. Okay, so now you can see that the policy is potentially can generalize, that like can generalize to new environment. Um, but we also want to just add a, as a, like, kind of dig one layer deeper and ask the question of where does this generalization capability really come from, right? So I think one of the subtle details I haven't mentioned is that all the policy that I show you today is actually started by using a pre-trained visual encoder that is clip um, visual encoder that is already trained on in, uh, internet data. So it is possible, or at least some, someone will have a hypothesis, that maybe the visual encoder itself that's trained on the internet data already provides this generalization capability, and we actually don't need this in the wild action uh, data. So we ourselves is also very curious about this question, so that's why we conduct like, even more experiments. So in this particular experiment, we still keep the visual encoder that is pre-trained uh, with clip on the internet data. But now instead of using this in the wild data set, we actually collect a narrow domain action data set that's doing this task in the lab environment. So the question now is that with this combination, whether the, uh, the, the robot policy is still able to do auto domain um, generalization. 
So the short answer is that uh, not really. Right? So uh, actually, with two hours of press, it's not just slightly worse. It actually completely doesn't work. So th this robot actually does not even go to the cuff and it's not, just not, don't know, really know how to do this task in this uh, auto distribution environment. However, this the same policy actually can work really well in the lab environment, in this narrow domain that we test on. Uh, in the narrow domain that we train on. So here is just a quick comparison of our policy that is actually trained with the in the, in the wild action data. So I think the take, uh, quick takeaway here is that as, at least for today, like if you draw the conclusion today, I think the finding large pre-trained vision model with a narrow domain robot data is still insufficient for generalization. So what's the conclusion made from here is that we still need diverse robot uh, action data. So I think this is really help us to kind of put it into perspective that maybe a lot of people think that if we have internet scale data, can we just make a smart use of those internet data and, uh, and so that the robot can work? I think maybe yes in, in the future, but right now still we cannot do that. Okay, so to take a step back and quickly summarize uh, this uh, UMI project and think about how they're actually able to address each of those um, data collection issues, right? So for the first one, um, because the interface is so e easy and intuitive to use, you no longer need to train yourself uh, to, in order to help the robot to collect data. And then uh, because the, the setup is very portable and low cost, you can easily pass this hardware to your friends to get into different environments in order to cover the large and diverse task space. And also you can tell your friends to help you collect data. Don't be afraid of making mistakes during demonstration because those error correction data is actually very important and useful for the downstream policy training. And then for the last part, protect your environment. Now, because we use only wristbound camera, we don't need to calibrate the camera at all. You actually don't really worry about uh, anyone touch your, your setup or, or, or your camera. Um, you actually can achieve very easy deployment for your robots, drag it out, and it, it can work. The system is a lot more robust now, and all engineers are much, all the students are much happier because they don't need to worry about camera cali calibration. I would say this is a big deal if you like really care about robot deployment, uh, I think this is a quality of life improvement. <laughs> so if you are hopefully at, the, at this point, uh, I pick your interest and you want to try it out. So all the code base and hardware guidelines of how to build UMI's uh, data set just got released today. So it's all like fresh out of the oven. Um, and also we have the diffusion policies code base. So for any of those um, part like code or the hardware, if you have suggestions or questions, feel free to reach out to us and we are constantly improving it. We really hope that we can maintain uh, a nice like open source environment that everybody can contribute to. Okay, so I will probably, I will, uh, um, I will conclude my talk by trying to share a few thoughts about robotics and uh, large scale data. So this is mostly my personal opinion, but we all know that um, data is very important for learning, right? More the better. But I think unfortunately as roboticists, we may not have the luxury to just sit there and wait for the perfect data to emerge on the internet. But also at the same time, as roboticists, we do have a lot of powerful tools and knowledge at our disposal to create the right data for robot learning. Right? So for example, we have high quality physics simulators or we can design our new hardware or sensors to help us to scale up uh, the data collection for robots. Those tools and knowledge are something that uh, most of the ML researchers don't have. That's our advantage. And I really believe that the data that's well driven by physical robots in the physical world will eventually go beyond the internet data we have today in terms of both of scale and richness. And then I think what I really hope uh, for my today's talk is to encourage you as the current and the future roboticists really think about how you can make use of your unique skill set and knowledge to help us to shape the next generation of big data. So, I think, for example, there's a lot of existing exciting work in the community that's trying to approach this uh, data problem from many different directions. Like, for example, Aloha is something very, uh, like, quite famous. I think this is a very nice framework as well, like hardware design that helps us to reduce the cost of data collection for very dexterous manipulation tasks. There's open X embodiment uh, data sets. All this work, I think, is very exciting, and I highly recommend you to check it out. 
And also very interesting to hear your thoughts. So if you like have like ideas or thoughts, I'm happy to hear them. And, and um, please email to me uh, your, your ideas as well. And uh, with that, I want to uh, just thank all my collaborators and the funding agencies, and most importantly, uh, my students who make all these uh, projects possible. And um, I'm happy to take questions. And if I may, I want to just like, introduce this picture. So this is actually a picture that every student makes a, a, a little toy for themselves. And you can see that this little robot actually has this gripper. So this is Cheng. Uh, and then if you like, look carefully, and you can, for example, this is LM, uh, LLM planner, diffusion policy. And then uh, they actually made different uh, robots uh, for their own research. Uh, so that's like a very cute photo. Questions? Um, beautiful talk. Thank you so much. I was curious. So I think you t today you demonstrated how, uh, with enough data, you can generalize to change in environments with the same hardware. I was curious whether uh, a similar approach can be used to generalize among different hardware platforms. Mm. So for instance, you might have rigid fingers, two fingers instead of uh, two fingers, or maybe you have more fingers, or yeah. Yeah, that is still hard, uh, but what I can tell you what we can do already with the current, uh, current setup. We can generalize to different robot embodiments that has different, like for your arms. Like if the hand is the same, you, you switch the same hand, uh, you can, we, we can actually deploy the same policy on Franca, on UR5, or on other different robot arms, because we only care about the, the observation below the hand, right? Um, if you want the same data or the policy to directly generalize to different like, hands, I think that probably requires more involved uh, like engineering. Like maybe you need a different way to train the policy. So instead of training directly from a visual motor policy that come from image to action, maybe instead you want to train a dynamics model that per, like kind of just learned uh, like general dynamics of how action will change the environment and then use that dynamics model to kind of infer the action or have a separate like inverse model for your robots. So that is not yet done. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Would it be possible to get Yumi like out in the wild to the general public and just like instead of scraping it in the data, just like tell them all to gather data for you? Yeah, I, I, I think it's possible. Uh, it does require us to think carefully about the incentives. Or like you can obviously hire people to do it, um, but you kind of need to be a big company to, to do that. Uh, or if you like, I think self-driving car is a, a nice example. Is that it's not only has a good interface; it's also something that people have to do on a daily day-to-day -day basis. They need to drive. So right now, I don't think we have a, like a like a nice a business model or like scale up model that also provides the, uh, the user incentive to use this uh, hardware. But at least we show that it's, it's not hard; it's easy, uh, and it's doable. Yeah. Are there any special type of tasks that you found particularly hard to do, even with this you know, very beautiful framework, like you know, working with soft informal objects? Uh, and, and don't lead her. Let's see what she says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. soft informal objects is not hard. Uh, it's actually pretty easy um, uh, because it, it, the object itself is compliant. Uh, Grasp it is not hard. Um, there are uh, things that are hard. I think it's quite. A, I think the biggest lim limiting factor is the form, form factor for the finger itself. Right now, you can see that it's quite big. And then the reason that it's, it's big is because we wanted to directly apply for like UR5 type of robots. As a result, it cannot really do like very fine-grained detailed manipulation uh, tasks. For example, the ones that uh, Alo has pretty good at, like those like putting on contact, I think right now it's not good enough. And I think that is limited by like the size of the gripper. But if you just shrink down everything, like make it smaller, I think it's possible. Um, Okay. <laughs> so, uh, most manipulation tasks involve contact and uh, being able to apply specific forces when we go to more complex tasks. And um, it seems like most uh, uh, data we are collecting today is, for life. It is aimed at finding the trajectories, finding positions. And, in fact, I don't think this is a difficult thing. I mean, if you know where you want to go today, uh, it's very easy to send the robot there. I mean, this is not really the problem. But you're solving many different problems at the same time. You're so solving the grasping of configuration. You're solving how uh, 
what speed at which you're moving, what what uh, contact, uh, I mean, grasping force. Yeah. But I think missing the forces and moment being applied mm -hmm. uh, is, is really, really a major limitation uh, for many of the data we are collecting today. That's true. I think that uh, clearly we are missing those information or like, uh, for, for a large part. But maybe I can, I can address it from two angles. First is that I think with the current set, how we can observe some force information, right? So I emphasize a few times that uh, like the, the, the finger is deformable. You actually can kind of observe like how much force you're, you're applying through the deformation. We have contact microphone tell you the contact events. Uh, and then the contact microphone also can tell you like the contact force actually um, a little bit, and even the contact position. Um, so we have some of this information. It's not completely in the, in the dark. And then second is that um, for a lot of tasks, actually surprisingly, with force, we'll probably be able to do it better. But with a very uh, like high rate close to policy, you can already do the task pretty well. I think that's something that um, like surprised to uh, like is kind of surprised to a lot of people that if you just like train a policy to do close to control and you have like fast react rate with respect to your visual data, you can kind of get away without a lot of like high quality force feedback. 